This is the PowerPoint lecture for cardiovascular medications, and it's part two. In this section, we're going to review antihypertensive medications, including diuretics. We're going to look at antiarrhythmic medications and cardiac glucosides. Hypertension is a major cause of death and disability in our country. So, as allied healthcare professionals, we need to understand what blood pressure is and how medications help control it. Blood pressure is regulated by three things. The first is cardiac output, which is the volume of blood pumped by the heart in one minute. Number two is peripheral vascular resistance. The resistance is determined by the flexibility or the size of the arteries. Arterial sclerosis or fatty plaque in the arteries is one condition that can cause this. Blood volume is our third regulating factor. When blood volume is decreased, such as if a patient was hemorrhaging, the blood pressure will drop. The kidneys also play a critical role by regulating blood volume. So in review, the force of the heart's contraction, the amount of blood that is pumped, and the resistance of the blood vessels all influence blood pressure. So let's briefly look at blood pressure. So what do these numbers mean? Well, there are two numbers. The top number is systolic. Remember, S is for the sky. This is when the ventricles contract and the pressure is high in the heart. When the ventricles relax, the pressure is low and you get the diastolic pressure or that bottom number. When an individual has chronic high blood pressure, it's hard for the kidneys to remove the excess fluid and this stresses other circulatory organs too. The heart and the blood vessels are being totally stressed and overworked. An important system that helps with blood pressure regulation is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. So, the kidneys at any given moment are sensing our blood pressure and fluid volume. It does this every moment of every day. If the blood pressure is low, the kidneys spring into action and they release a messenger called renin that travels to the liver and asks for help to raise the blood pressure. So the liver releases angiotensin 1. Now, ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, comes in and changes angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is the most powerful vasoconstrictor we have in our bodies. With vasoconstriction, blood pressure goes up. But angiotensin 2, I'll call her Angie for short, she's not done yet. She needs more help, so she calls her friend aldosterone, who is a hormone in the adrenal gland of the kidney. Aldosterone will save sodium. Water follows sodium, so now we have increased blood volume and increased blood pressure. So as we review antihypertensive medications, we will see how many of these drugs interfere with this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system to bring blood pressure down. As you'll learn, though, there are a variety of ways to bring blood pressure down. We will review beta blockers that block the effect of the sympathetic nervous system and the fight or flight. Diuretics will cause the body to flush out fluids, reducing fluid volume. We can also vasodilate or widen the blood vessels by interrupting with this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. You know, I've heard that 70% of people with primary hypertension have excess angiotensin. You know, lastly, we can also block calcium from signaling the blood vessels to tighten, which will also bring blood pressure down. So here's the first medication that interferes with that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. ACE inhibitors block the enzyme ACE. Remember, the ACE changes angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So if we stop that conversion, we stop the vasoconstriction that brings up blood pressure. Side effects of these medications are headache, cough, taste disturbance, and the serious side effect is angioedema. An interesting note is that when we block ACE, we increase a chemical called bradykinin, which is a powerful bronchoconstrictor. That's where the side effect cough comes from with these medications. An example of these medications are enalapril. These meds all end in pril, so you have the calendar April to remember. A is for ACE inhibitors and the serious side effect, angioedema, and they end in pril. 
So with these medicines and all blood pressure medicines, we're going to monitor the blood pressure. We also should look for hyperkalemia or high potassium with these medications. When we block that angiotensin aldosterone system, we block aldosterone. Aldosterone not only affects sodium and water, but it helps rid the body of potassium. So we need to watch for hyperkalemia. Please note that with my mnemonics for these antihypertensives, I have not added hypotension in any of these. That will always be a consideration and could be a potential side effect of antihypertensive medications. Always consider with every medication that they can do their job too well. The ARBs, or angiotensin receptor blockers, allow the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, but they block the receptors on the blood vessels so that angiotensin 2 can't cause vasoconstriction. Again, when peripheral vascular resistance is decreased or vasoconstriction is decreased, it brings the blood pressure down. ARBs may be used if the patient can't tolerate ACE inhibitors. These medications can cause dizziness, upper respiratory symptoms like sinusitis, pharyngitis, rhinitis, respiratory infections, and palpitations. Angioedema is an adverse effect of this medication. Sartin is an example of an ARB. These meds end in Sartin. As always, we must assess blood We learn with the nervous system that there are beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the heart and beta-2 receptors in the airway. These receptors are turned on with adrenaline, the fight or flight. Remember, blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, airway opens. So blocking these beta receptors can cause a lower heart rate and blood pressure. The side effects of beta blockers are three Bs, bronchospasm, blood sugar, and bradycardia. Does this make sense when we think about fight or flight? However, you know medications can all work overboard. If we affect this system too much, we can take the pulse down too low and we can tighten the airway, so bradycardia and bronchospasm. The last side effect is blood sugar. When beta or fight or flight is initiated, the production of glucose is activated. So when we use beta blockers, glucose can go down. Actually, it can go up with these meds, but most importantly though, signs or symptoms of hyper or hypoglycemia may be masked because these are sympathetic responses and we have blocked these receptors. An example of beta blockers are metropolol and these meds all end in OLOL. Again, before administering these medications, we need to check the blood pressure and the pulse. Calcium causes muscles and blood vessels to contract, which elevates our blood pressure. These calcium channel blockers then block the calcium ions that pass into the heart muscle and the blood vessel walls. The heart vessels dilate, which decreases the contraction of the heart and brings blood pressure down. For side effects, I think of calcium channel blockers, CCB. The first side effect is cabeza dolor, which is headache. Fundamentally, remember whenever we vasodilate cardiac vessels, we vasodilate cerebral vessels. When our cerebral vessels in our brain are vasodilated, it can cause a headache. So the first side effect is headache. The second is constipation. Believe it or not, there are calcium channels in our intestines, so when we block those, that causes constipation. And again, lastly, the B is for bradycardia. An example of these medications are amlodipine. Most of them end in P-I-N-E, but as we've learned, not every medication follows the rules or has the proper endings, the ones that we would like to help us memorize them. Verapamil and ditilizum are examples of calcium channel blockers that don't follow the P-I-N-E. If you notice in these pictures, there are yellow bulbs on the pine tree. 
the P-I-N-E. Um, those are grapefruit. Grapefruit and calcium channel blockers do not mix. Patients cannot be taking in grapefruit to take these calcium channel blockers. Again, when we administer these medications, we must check the blood pressure and the heart rate. All right, so let's do a quick review. Analapril, what kind of medicine is that? Asin, hip, right? Headache, cough, taste disturbance, and angioedema. Next is losartan. That's our ARB, right? Next is metropolol, OLOL. There's our beta blocker, bradycardia, blood sugar, and bronchospasm. Next is nifedipine. Peen, see the cow? There's our calcium channel blockers. All right, remember again that blood volume helps regulate blood pressure. So many times diuretics or water pills may be given to encourage the kidneys to excrete fluid. Less fluid in the body creates less blood volume and thus less pressure in the blood vessels. The three types of diuretics we're going to discuss are loose diuretics, thiazide diuretics, and potassium sparing diuretics. As we review diuretics, remember that we must always assess blood pressure, intake and output, and electrolyte imbalances. So we have first the loop diuretics. These end in MIDE, and these are our most potent diuretics. These are heavy hitters. They act on the loop of Henle in the nephron to inhibit sodium and chloride reabsorption. The most common one that we use is ferrisamide or Lasix. With this drug, we must watch for hypokalemia. Thiazide diuretics are the most common class of diuretics. They decrease sodium and chloride reabsorption in the distal tubule. Again, we must monitor for hypokalemia. Hydrochlorothiazide is the most popular. Many times when patients are prescribed loop or thiazide diuretics, which are potassium depleting, supplemental potassium may be given especially with those strong loop diuretics like Lasix. As healthcare professionals, we need to always monitor blood pressure and potassium levels. If potassium levels are too low or too high, they can weaken the heart and cause life-threatening arrhythmias. All right, here's a potassium sparing diuretic. It is actually a steroid inhibitor. The example of these medications are aldactone or spirolactone. These medications interrupt the sodium potassium exchange in the distal tubule, but they don't deplete the potassium. So remember, aldactone leaves potassium alone. But then, on that hand, we need to watch for hyperkalemia. Other side effects may include headache and diarrhea. All right, let's quickly review our diuretics. Ferrisamide, M-I-D-E, those are our powerful loop diuretics. Watch for hypokalemia. Hydrochlorothiazide, those are our thiazide diuretics. Again, watch for hypokalemia. And aldactone, or our aldosterone inhibitors, these are potassium sparing, so watch for hyperkalemia. So here's a quick look back at that renin angiotensin aldosterone system and look at the medications that interfere with it. First, remember we talked about the release of renin. Well, you know, there are renin blockers that I didn't talk about. They're not very common yet. They're not really in use very much yet, but they do have them. Aliscarin is one of them, or Tecturna. Okay, so here we have the ACE, ACE inhibitors that block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to 2. Now there's your ARBs, which keeps the angiotensin II from causing the vasoconstriction because it blocks the receptors. And look over on your right, there's the aldosterone blockers like aldactone. Pretty cool, huh? 
Chronic high blood pressure can put stress on the heart and cause the heart to be unable to push the normal amount of blood around the body. This is called congestive heart failure. Signs and symptoms are anxiety, cyanosis, tachycardia, edema, tachypnea, and cough. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and diuretics are often used to slow the heart rate down and decrease the amount of blood that the heart has to push. Vasodilators and cardiac glucosides may also be used for this disorder. Cardiac glucosides are another heart medication that we needed to review. And did you look at the GLY? These are made up of three sugars and they work by slowing the heartbeat down and they strengthen the contraction. Digoxin or lenoxin is our cardiac glucoside. There's only one. Because these medications cause bradycardia, and we know that they do, we must always check the patient's pulse before we give these medications. And if that heart rate is below 60, we need to hold the medications. You know, doctors will often draw blood levels of digoxin to make sure the patient does not develop toxic effects. Digoxin has a narrow therapeutic range, and the therapeutic drug levels must be monitored. We also must watch for dig toxicity, digoxin toxicity. With this, the patient may have nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and visual disturbances. Lastly, we have the antiarrhythmic medications. So causes of abnormal heart rhythms may include hypertension, cardiac valve disease, coronary artery disease, potassium level alterations, heart failure, diabetes, stroke or MI, and certain medications. So to treat dysrhythmias, we can block either the sodium, the potassium, and the calcium channels, and also the beta-1 receptors to work with dysrhythmias. You know, when you take a patient's pulse, it's always a good idea to check that pulse for one full minute so that we don't miss a dysrhythmia that would benefit from these kind of medications. Well, that's it for part two of cardiovascular medications. If you have any questions, make sure you let me know. Bring them to the Farm Cafe or bring them to class.